All right, Sherry, I got two o'clock Eastern. Is it okay if I go ahead and kick us off officially? Let's do it. All right, well, cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, I should say, if it's uh, if you're out on the West Coast and uh, if you're watching the recording, I hope you're having a good day no matter where you are. But we are here to talk about whether or not your fundraising staff is leaving money on the table. Don't want that. Oh, I love that topic. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we're gonna have fun over the next hour or so. I'm Steven, I'm over here at Bloomerang and I'll be moderating today's uh, discussion as always. And just a couple of housekeeping items, just wanna let everyone know that we are recording this session. So if you have to leave early or maybe get interrupted or, or just wanna review the content, don't worry, we'll get you the slides, the recording, and uh, you can review all that content uh, later on. So have no fear. Uh, but most importantly, if you are uh, listening live, please do chat in your questions and comments along the way. We're going to leave some time at the end for Q&A. So don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. You can send us a tweet. There's a Q&A box and a chat box. You can use either of those. Although if you use the Q&A box, it might be a little bit easier to see uh, a little insider hint for you. Um, but uh, bottom line is we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, uh, welcome. We do these webinars every Thursday. Uh, we love doing them. We've been doing them for Whole history of the company almost 10 years now wow. and uh but if you never heard of boomerang beyond the webinars we're a provider of donor management software so if you're interested in that check us out and visit our website you know there's all kinds of great resources on there videos you can watch and, and we get a sense of, of what we're all about uh but don't do that right now because sherry qt is joining us from <laughs> from beautiful chicago the city of my birth how's it going sherry you doing okay we're do i'm doing awesome over here <laughs> yeah this is great to have you uh, You've probably Thank done, you. what, four or five webinars? I you know mean, what? It's been a handful. It's and, just great. Uh, I got to tell you, it's one of my favorites. So I, I'm glad to be with you today. You got a spot on the calendar every year. Thank you know, you. don't worry. And and you all, if you've never heard her present, uh, I think you'll be back next year for sure. And and check her out. She's an awesome uh, nonprofit consultant. She's a coach. She works with CEOs. She works with teams, boards, and um, has a really cool methodology that uh, I, I, I hope you all explore uh, on her website later on. Um, but hey, you know, we all want to raise more money and, and that's what we're here to talk about. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Sherry. I don't want to talk uh, okay, take great. any more time for you. So I'm going to stop sharing and let's see if we can get your slides okay. to work here. There we go. Great. We'll do, so the, the, do the official handoff. Looks like it might be working. Cool. Okay, good. Okay, take it away, my friend. Okay, great. Happy Thursday. <laughs> I had to check myself on that. Okay, so today we're talking about fundraising, leaving money on the table. Uh, none of those things that, that any of us want to think that we might be doing or our teams might be doing. And so I'm so glad that you're, you're here today. So as Stephen said, I'm a, a longtime friend of, of Bloomerang. And so if, you're, if we're just meeting for the first time today, uh, I'm in Chicagoland, uh, like Stephen said. And I like to tell you these couple little nuggets because it really positions um, where I'm headed, I guess, in, in what, what I'm talking um, to you about today. So I started migrating my corporate career a long time ago now, if you do that math, and had some early success in scaling the organization and specifically scaling the organization's unrestricted charitable funding. And we tripled that revenue in 18 months, which was a super fun ride, if you can imagine, a little stressful too, but really fun. Here's what I want you to hear today. I found out pretty early that a lot of things weren't quite adding up. And I, as I got to learn the sector and, you know, was talking to other leaders, talking to other fundraisers, I found that a lot of the approaches or advice or kind of industry misconceptions were keeping great organizations from growing. And they, and they were doing awesome work, but their revenue was stuck, it had plateaued, um, or it was like just, it was a grind every year. And it's like, does it need to be? Um, and so part of my success is that I, I think from early on, I saw things differently. And I saw the need to come alongside other nonprofit CEOs who were killing it, like, like knocking it out of the park, but they still needed more money and they needed their revenue to grow at a higher rate because frankly, the amount of money they were bringing in was simply not matching their strategic plans or, or the plans within their strategic plans. And so since then, uh, you know, decade later, um, I've helped hundreds of nonprofits. I do that all over the country. Thankfully, I had a virtual business before 2020, um, really helping teams understand what's blocking 
their revenue growth and specifically their unrestricted revenue growth because you know that's what we need to be able to invest back in growth and staff and my favorite word, overhead. And so um, my clients regularly add six to seven figures of revenue to their bottom line um, as a result of using my methodology and, and my programs, which I'm really proud about. So what we're gonna talk about today, very specifically, and I'm gonna tell you three things we're gonna walk through. I really do hope this webinar is different than maybe what you thought I was gonna tell you today. Um, I say that because my approach is different and, um, and I'm proud of that and it gets results. So maybe try to take off the fundraising hat and put on the strategic growth hat as we go through this today. So I wanna, I wanna uncover and talk through a bunch of things that your team might be doing that's actually keeping your revenue from growing and, and maybe kind of sabotaging your, your growth trajectory. I wanna give some uh, kind of flat out uh, areas where I see the most money left on the table uh, and perhaps maybe give you some ideas on what to do instead. And then I wanna talk about this concept of your team, because we don't wanna leave money on the table. A lot of times that's because we aren't aligning our time and our schedule and frankly, every hour that we are spending fundraising on things that generate the most amount, that generate larger gifts, unrestricted gifts, so that we can pour it back into that growth and overhead, uh, which is so important for all of our organizations. I think I'm yet to meet an organization who doesn't who doesn't want more flexible cash to to really invest in growth and um, invest in the things that you know you need, right? Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick flyover today how my methodology works. I want to talk to you about one of my clients, Jonathan, uh, and his team and how they've had killer results here the last couple of years. But first, I want to ask you this question. And I listened to this podcast, uh, it's probably a month or two ago, and there was this guest, Judy Holler. I don't know if you follow her. She's uh, really, really dynamic, really out there. But she's like this um, set your goal and like fear buster to help you set your goal and just kind of like, great, it's fear, embrace it. That means you're growing. Let's push toward it. Um, and so I was listening to this podcast and, um, she was talking about goal setting and I, and I'm a goal setter. I've got my, uh, you know, I'm the first to admit my entire life is in like all of these Excel spreadsheets and cause I have a goal and I'm backing up and you know, what does it look like this year? What does it look like next year? But when she talked in this podcast, um, and maybe I'll link the podcast actually, when I, when I send out the, the slides or, um, afterwards, um, there was this way she framed goal setting that, to be really honest, is super practical and just at first glance is like, yeah, makes sense, nothing really new. But there's a way that she talked about it that was really fresh. And I thought, I thought oh gosh, this is, this is um, a really great way to frame revenue growth for my clients. And so I wanna start there today. I wanna kind of talk through that. And so these were the steps. And, and, and again, they're really simple. simple. It's like, okay, take your goal, you have a goal right? Like we want to, we want to grow from 5 million to 10 million. Let's just kind of use that today. Okay. So let's take that goal. And now we've naturally set our boundaries. Those, our goal, because we want to be 10 million, that, that kind of backing it up, that sets our boundaries. And then we have to let those boundaries direct our time. We have to be, um, we have to be aware of this. And there's, again, it's, it's so simple, but I was like, oh, that's actually the methodology I teach in fundraising. So let me, let me, let me build on these three things and show you what I mean. So when we talk about um, this concept and really allowing it to be this simple, you as fundraisers, I don't, I don't need to be the ones to tell you, um, or if, or anybody on this who's, who's growing something, right? We have to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. We have to know what to stop doing and what to start doing that maybe got us to this point and got us to 5 million, but it isn't going to get us to 10 million. And so when we think of that step one, that goal setting, you know, the goal setting is not the problem. Like uh, our, our sector is led, led um, from visionaries who are we're pushing people to like, we have a goal to end this. We have a goal to change this in our community. Uh, we want to scale, you know, these are my client examples, right? We want to scale 25% every year for the next year. So we want to double the families. We want to replicate our model across the country. 
we want to actually do or have enough money to do what's in our strategic plan. Um, our goals are really easy to articulate. It's uh, number two and three that actually kind of, that's where we get stuck, right? And so that's what we're talking about today. Now, the number one thing, let's cut to the chase here. The number one thing that keeps fundraising teams from reaching that goal and frankly, you know, causes them to leave money on the table, which is we're never going to reach the goal there, is the misalignment of these three things together. And and try what and what when even one of them is misaligned, and then we try to, to fundraise in that framework, like we're never going to A reach goals. We're never going to um, be securing a donor's best gift in every scenario. And it's always going to be difficult. And so how do we do this? How do we do this? We have to do it differently. I want you to hear today that there is a different way to fundraise. Like there's a different way to fully fund our organizations and to finance your amazing strategic plan. Like let's finance the whole thing and let's do it every year, right? Because when stats show that over 91% of nonprofits never reach $5 million, that's, a, that's like a, a, a bonkers stat to me because who, who did we need most <laughs> these last 18 months, right? And so we have, you have to be okay and, and be open to thinking differently and breaking free from a lot of these traditional models and things that the sector tells us we should do because many times those things are actually sabotaging our growth and keeping your team from really raising to their full capacity. Okay, so let me let me start with a case study and I'm gonna move into the details and break it down for you. Um, this is my client, Jonathan, who's amazing. Now, here's Jonathan's situation. Um, in 2018, he took the reins of an historic organization, but it, it was really struggling uh, financially. And so um, they had been in the red for quite a few years. And so when he came to me in early 2020, like right on the edge of before 2020 went sideways, um, he had moved the organization into the black. Um, they weren't bleeding anymore, right? Um, this is where he started. Now, that was good. So we got the expenses in line. Um, but now, but now here was the problem. Now it was like, okay, I got that in line, but now I need more money because like he's a visionary entrepreneurial leader. And so now we have to do that. But the problem was um, he'd never done that before, right? He'd never designed, scaled, reorged a, a development team. And that's really what he needed to do. So that was the first struggle. Second struggle was his team had historically raised mostly uh, more like transactional gifts. And so, you know, um, and again, I want you to get these, these gifts too, right? But, but really focused on foundations, on corporate sponsorships, the golf outing, the gala, um, all of these things that we all do, um, tell, not telling you not to do them, but it was mostly that, right? And so therefore the revenue from individuals and, and, and those very relationship-based uh, donors was was pretty stagnant. And um, the problem was this team really didn't have a lot of experience with mid and major level gifts, didn't have experience leading donors to their best gift. And because and, and, that's a totally different skill set, right? Now, Jonathan is an accomplished entrepreneur, um, but he was kind of guessing when it came to fundraising or, you know, growing the team and doing that sort of thing. And so Jonathan heard me on this podcast I was on and came to me and said to me, and I, I had made this comment on the podcast, and you'll hear me say it today. Um, I, I had asked, I said, are your donors um, giving their best gift to the organization? Can you honestly say everybody is understands the need, is like understands the story, understands the lives that are changing, and they're giving their best gift? And are they giving that best gift every year? And so he reached out to me and said, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure they're not, you know, I think they're just kind of giving what they think we need. He was right. So making this shift, um, he now has a very donor segmented financing plan that actually matches his, his aggressive growth plans. And they're aggressive and they should be aggressive because he's working in educational equity uh, here in Chicago. Um, he's learned how to take those transactional relationships where there was money sitting on the table and lead corporate donors 
from a lot of that traditional transactional type of sponsorship or those kind of gifts, he's learned how to lead them into larger unrestricted gifts. Um, he consistently finds and secures six-figure gifts um, from donors who previously weren't giving those gifts, didn't know how to help, um, you know, just they, they weren't giving their best gift. Um, and today he's raising double the revenue of gifts 10K and above because he's been using this methodology. So let me tell you a little detail here. I'm going to focus in on this best gift thing. I want you to hear me, or maybe I'll say to you, ask yourself, are all are your donors giving their best gift? And what would it take for me to move them onto that path? And so if we look at his 10K and above gifts in 2019, there's 42 people giving above that. Okay. You know, some of you'd say, oh, that's small. Some of you say, oh, I'd kill for 42 people giving above that. Now, in two, in two, this year they're finishing, um, it's 57. It's like, well, that's not that many, Sherry. So it's good growth, but it's slow growth, right? And it was a wild year in between those two times, we know. Here's the thing. When we look at those 42 donors, it was under a million dollars in that exact area. And when we look at the 57, you know, it was over $2 million. And so... I want you to see that that best gift scenario is a game changer. Now, most people come to me and say, how do I find new donors? I got to find them. I'm like hunting, hunting new donors. We can do that. We can work on that. We do that too. But don't leave money on the table with your current donors. If you are not leading them, serving them, guiding them, helping them understand, we'll talk about what that looks like you're going to leave money on the table. And they were leaving money on the table, right? Like he was correct. You know, are we leaving money on the table? Yeah, they were. And these numbers show it. Um, but his staff wasn't leading. They were being very reactive. Time for the gala again. Oh, then it's golf. Now it's fiscal year end appeal. Oh, we got to send that thing out. And it's just leaving money on the table. And they, they'd never had to do that before. They're rock stars at all those other things. They're doing great but they didn't know how to take that relationship, grow it in that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of CEO to CEO type of investment level uh, conversation language and lead them to their best gift. And so now the organization is on a completely different growth trajectory, thank thankfully, and his team is a well-oiled boundary setting. That's what we're talking about today. Um, they, they've got their plan, they've got their boundaries and they know how to allocate their time to the things that raise money. And so why did this work, right? Why did this work so well? Well, there's three main reasons. Um, he had the goal, right? Like he learned how to, and he learned how to, I'm gonna say like put on different glasses and see that a lot of the traditional things or, or I should say only doing a lot of the traditional fundraising approaches um, was actually like causing them to be very siloed and was actually causing them to um, not grow. You know, you saw that, you saw the, the, the bar chart. Um, he set new boundaries, right? Like this is the goal. And so now we have new boundaries. He learned what his team should stop doing and what they should start doing. And what they should start doing was um, doing the activities that started attracting larger donors, attracting larger gifts that helped um, his organization uh, lead donors to a deep understanding of what the need was. So he aligned his, his, um, his staff's time with the boundaries and that's all done in this concept of a financing plan, right? Before we, before we design our fundraising plans, we gotta know how, how would we fund everything we want to do? What is that very nuts and bolts plan? Because that tells us what our fundraising activities should be for the year. Okay, I'm getting excited here. <laughs> I caught myself like really getting animated here. Um, number three, um, this team was equipped, right? They, he invested in, in equipping his team to really learn how do we make that shift? And is it okay to make that shift? And we've always done that thing for like six years and I think people love it. And like, don't we have to have that golf outing and like, you know, all those things, right? Um, he learned how to shift his team into the activities that actually started securing a donor's best gift. And that helped them really see there was so much money left on the table. So in order for you to do this, there's three steps you need to follow. And so 
The first step, and I'm going to align it with our three things here. This works so well today. So it's our goal. So I want you to think about how would I pause and really shift into this like true and overall financing model that actually sets your whole team, sets your whole board. Um, everybody knows what to do because they're they're aligned. They know what the goal is. We want to go from you know five to ten million in I don't know three years or whatever it is. So that tells us what we need to do. That tells us how much unrestricted cash do we need? How much of this do we need? Um, where are the areas we need to grow so that we have that growth flexibility? Now we have our boundaries, we have our goal. Now we have to train the team. We have to train the board how to do this high, high ROI fundraising, right? We have to align, align every hour your team is spending with results because time is the number one thing I hear from people that they don't have. So if we're going to spend those four hours fundraising today, it sure as heck better bring in the dollars that we need. Um, and then we have that those hours, we're going to go, okay, so those are our hours we have. We have to create exceptional donor experiences. And we have to be doing the activities that are leading donors to that best gift every year. And so for the rest of our time together, I'm going to walk through these three steps. So if you don't have your pen and, pen and paper out, now's, now's, when, now's when you should do it. Um, these are the exact, exact steps Jonathan took and, um, and, and you can take to do this uh, yourself. Okay, so let's talk about this number one um, section about how to shift in, into this kind of funding model or financing plan that actually is like the first domino of your success every year. Um, Here's the thing, um, and this can feel intimidating if like you don't have, if you're like, oh, the numbers thing, it's not my thing. Everybody can learn this. Everybody can put together a true numbers-based plan that would keep you in the black and that would not, um, you wouldn't have to like kind of feel like, oh, we've been in the red the last three years. And so I'm sure it'll be this way again. It needs to, your financing plan needs to be set up not only for your missions need, but also your reserve. Everybody needs a reserve. Everybody needs a larger reserve. We learned that in 2020. So part of this first step, uh, and it's kind of the maybe the most fun part, is we got to get you investment level ready. We have to get you positioned um, as something that large donors see themselves investing in. And, and I'll say large donor, like this might for you, a large donor might be $2,000, right? And somebody else on this call, large donor is, is $200,000 or $20,000, everything in between. This exact model, I use it on, I was telling Stephen beforehand, I use it on $500,000 organizations and I use it on 30, plus mil, 30 million plus dollar organizations, exact same thing. But oftentimes we are doing the things that sometimes are keeping investment level donors from understanding our need. Uh, I'll tell you what I mean. Um, so we have to design the financing plan that actually is an all-in number that actually propels the growth and supports all the activities. Uh, I should say supports. It drives the activities that your fundraising staff should be doing. Can I talk about budgeting? <laughs> Everybody's always surprised. Why are we talking about budgeting when this is a fundraising discussion? I'll tell you why. Because most everybody who comes to me is not fully funded because of their approach to budgeting, which is tied to this financing plan. Um, hang with me here. Here's what I mean. So there's a question I ask everybody. Uh, if you called me today, I'd ask you this. I'd say, what, what do you need this year? What do you need, right? A lot of you are starting your fiscal years here. Um, and it's a little bit of a trick question, right? I want to know how would you answer that? If I'm a donor saying, Stephen, what do you need this year? What would you answer, right? And so often we say, well, you know, we're, we're at that $5 million mark and, you know, we're, we'd really like to grow and we're kind of hoping we could do this because we really want to do this. And so that's kind of what we're, we're, we're hoping to do. Right. And so this is not what, this is not, that's not the correct answer. I guess I'll say that. What, what I'm really asking is what do you need? Right. Um, there's the number your budget is, you're probably board approved budget. And then there's the number you're raising toward, right? And I'm not saying, oh, in year one, be wild. We need $10 million. We need 20. Look, we just need it because if we had more money, we would do more things. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but when that donor says, what do you need? 
I want to hear you say, well, you know what, uh, we have a we have a, a $5.8 million need this year. Uh, I, I'd love to walk you through and share with you what that looks like. We got to know it, you know, because we're, we have a plan in place. We have a new strategic plan uh, in three years to be at $10 million. And so this is this growth. This is the step we're taking this year. You've got to be able to answer that. This sometimes is a huge mindset shift. What I mean by that is oftentimes we're told of, or we're kind of like planning and investing and budgeting and like, well, if we had the money, we'd do that, right? Versus, um, thank you for asking that question. Um, here's actually what we need this year, right? For a lot of you who, um, you know, maybe you uh, are heavy government funding or heavy, heavy contract funding through foundations. Um, sometimes it's like, well, we have this pledged. Well, we have these contracts, you know, but it's never enough, right? That's great you have those. But the annual budgeting and planning when it's based on, well, it's based on the 16 contracts we have versus, gosh, it's never enough. And we want to grow in that one community and we want to serve those people in a deep, deeper way. We have to make sure we're, we're raising to the right number in the first place. Most teams are not doing that. They are not, they have not set their number that they're raising to correctly in the first place. What do I mean by that? Um, or I'm going to go into that. Secondly, tied to that. So we're not raising to the right number in the first place. Um, many times, and I, and I hate this if you're uh, you know on the, on the development team today and you're like, yeah, that may, would make sense, but I don't get access to the budget. Secondly, too many fundraising teams um, are not intimately familiar with the budget and the numbers and would struggle sitting down and having an investment level conversation. Um, and that might not even be the fault of your own, right? It's like, you know, I, they just come and tell me what my number is every year. Well, that's leaving the money on the table because how are you gonna sit down with that CEO of a company and have that investment level conversation if you cannot walk them through, in this example, the $5.8 million need this year, right? It only makes sense. So oftentimes with a leader, the, well, the first step I'm looking at is, A, are you raising to the right number um, from the expense side, right? Because of, before we say 5.8 or 6.2 or 7.1, are you investing enough in your growth and organization that actually is going to propel your growth? You know, I suppose this is, are you spending enough money to make money? And it could be a number of things. It could be software. It could be your brand look and feel. It could be um, messaging, it could be your reserve, right? All, all these things um, that like we think we shouldn't put in because we don't know how we quite do that. And we're just a little nervous about that. Um, I want to encourage you to not be irrationally frugal when you're budgeting because it's keeping you from raising more money. The budgeting and being irrationally frugal, I stole that from another podcast. <laughs> I love that phrase. It's keeping you from raising money. You need, you cannot do more on less. You cannot do more on less. We know that, right? So if your fundraising team is going to secure investment level donations, if you're going to pick up all that money that's sitting on the table right now, you have to be able to share and articulate the true need in investment level conversations. When you want to attract larger donors, when you want to lead a donor, like I showed you in Jonathan's case, who's given, you know, $2,000, but we know they could give 25, we have to be able to share that need and articulate it. Now, the only way to do that is by the organization first, really understanding what they need and creating a needs-based budget. That's important. Here's why to the fundraisers. Because it's only until you say, yeah, the number is 5.8. Like, we really need that. We are going to put in that new website to redesign. We are going to hire that, you know, new program person. We are going to uh, invest in a development coordinator because you can't do it all. Or, or we are going to, uh, you know, invest in a, a full-time database manager because, like, that is not that. we got to have that data, right? Only when you do that, you know that number. Can your fundraising team create a true financing plan that fully funds your organization and hits that goal. So much of this is done, or so often this is done wrong, right? Like we say we have a $5.8 million need, and then we say, okay, well, Gala brings in this, 
uh, this brings in this. Uh, I don't know, we have these contracts. Well, it only kind of adds up to 4.2. So, okay, well, let's, let's, let's just try to grind more on what we were doing last year. That's not gonna get us to, to, to where we need to go. So I want you to uh, just quickly for like boards, um, if it, any board members aren't here, um, I want you to remember that 50% of the budget is the expenses. That's usually where we focus on approving. Oh, board approved the budget. Great. Okay, so that was the expense side, right? Now, let's talk about the 50% of the income side. Now, how are we going to do it? What does it look like month to month? What does it look like per donor segment? Okay, how, how, we, how is it going to balance, including the reserve? And so both when this part is done right, when you actually have from day one or kind of day one of the annual or fiscal year, excuse me, um, you, 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 you naturally move into here's what we need. And people want to buy that way over. Oh, I'm not so sure. Like that nervousness, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to hit it, right? You got to plan to hit it, right? Um, you move from that squeak by budget or that kind of scarcity mindset budget. It doesn't matter the size of it. Um, it never gets funded because you're, you're not setting the team up for success from day one. You can move into a real budget that reflects what you need. It helps you raise enough for your programs that we want to raise for and overhead and a reserve all in. Now on the income side, it we move from that like, well, you know, I even have a client right now who said, well, we're kind of planning to be in the red next year. I said, ho, 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 ho. I'm going to back that train up, right? I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to do it. You don't have to plan to be in the red. Let's, why would we plan to be in the red? I'm going to show them. I'm excited. Um, it's never high enough, right? To actually, that financing plan dictates every step. Um, it's your roadmap to run a balanced budget. It's so, it, it, and I see people make this change uh, kind of shift into this all the time. And it's a bit of an aha moment because we've been told so long, like, no, just figure out how to do more on less. Just kind of get it done, get another volunteer. And that's actually keeping us from raising more money. So when we, when we create these real budgets, I promise the first one is the longest. Um, when we create these real budgets, when, then we know actually what that financing plan is. That sets our boundaries right? And this is really where so much money is left on the table because most people think that in order to, you know, get that money on the table or move into these, you know, next level types of situations, um, it's, it's, it's going to be when that board turns around. I don't know. They don't help, you know, right now. Or it's going to be when Chance the Rapper retweets us or, um, or like when we finally get to that 95% program percentage that like that one donor is asking about. None of that is true. The one thing that attracts donors and attracts donors who can invest at a higher level is information. They're dying for you to sit down with them and have this stakeholder conversation with them and, and tell them what their gifts can do and tell them why you have a $5.8 million need and tell them how you're funded and tell them all of these things that sometimes we shy away from in the conversation. Like, oh, I hope they don't have, they, they don't ask that percentage question. Why not? Let's talk about it. Let's, let, let's educate them. Let's, let's know our numbers. Let's sit at the table. Let's bring it up. Right? Like, let's bring up that number in the 990 that we're a little nervous that they might see. This brings us to step number two, to my, to my paper airplane here. Um, let's talk about the boundaries, um, how to use these boundaries to drive time. So now we have our financing plan in place. We know how we're going to hit 5.8 in my example. I've, I picked a random number. Um, how do we use the boundaries to, to really make sure that we raise to that? And again, because I hear you, anytime I do a survey or anything, so what's the number one thing that's keeping you from hitting your goals? And the answer is time. I get it. I, I, I was in your shoes too. So most organizations are spending too much of their time and energy and budget on the activities that attract smaller gifts or lower dollar donors. 
again, I love you. I love, I love every size gift. Don't hear me say Sherry doesn't like events and small dollars. I love them, but we're spending too much time on them because it's like, well, I don't know how we would do that. So let me go over here and spend time on this. I want everybody giving their best gift. If $20 is your best gift, amazing. Let's serve them in an injustice amazing way because they're giving their best gift to the organization. Now on the flip side, you know, 70% of nonprofit revenue comes from just a small percent of the donor database, right? We have to remember this. And so when we, when we always lean into the data and metrics and, uh, you know, I, I love that Bloomerang publishes all these trends and like, I, I always love digging through that stuff. We, we know as fundraisers, when our time is limited, everything we do must be balanced in a model that actually is is, is uh, you know, factoring in our time, right? And it is high ROI. Because I, I'll tell a fundraiser, uh, and you might be the CEO here on this call or executive director, and you're the fundraiser, right? Great. Your time is the organization's most valuable asset. Like full stop, right? And so every hour you are spending fundraising has to be yielding the dollars you need to fully finance the amazing work you're doing, right? And so part of that is maybe kind of insinuated. It's like sometimes we got to push, push, push harder back on some of the crazy ideas that come our way. You know what you should do? You should start one of those online something somethings, or you should you should move that to some you know virtual blah blah. It's like I don't know. Should we like we got to go to the hours and the dollars now? So I'm going to ask you as a fundraiser on this call, where can you shift time away from some of the traditional transactional activities? There's always, we got to, we got to really be reflective and look, look inside our own time sheet, if you will. Um, so that we can stop doing some things that got us to this point that aren't going to get us to the next point so that we can start moving into this, the activities that are really in this high ROI generating model. And again, you've done nothing wrong to this point, but you might have to do something different to move forward. So this is this is a math problem, right? Like this is this is just simply aligning everybody on your teams, uh, everybody on your team, their time with the activities that are segmented appropriately, right? So a lot of times I'm taking this financing plan and I'm showing, I'm spreading it out for the fundraising staff. If it's one person, it's a little easier. If it's 20 people, it's interesting. Like who's, who's in charge of which donor segment and what does that look like and how are we gonna fully fund the organization? And so when this part is done right, decisions, or I would say um, we kind of move from making deci fundraising decisions based on, well, we always do that, or yeah, we should submit that. Um, I know it's, it's a restricted, it's a giant restricted gift. We should still do it. I'd probably tell you to still do it. But but that some if we're only focusing there, you know, we get the highs and the low in our cash flow. Uh, we're trying to be kind of everything to everyone. And we tend to bring in a lot more restricted cash than we should, which is which keeps us from growing. When we're making decisions based on relationships and when we're aligning our time on relationship-based um, donors, we can move into a, a very heavy unrestricted model. Um, we can have organizations that have steady growing revenue. I see it all the time, um, but we got to really not, we got to be okay with stop doing something so we can start really focusing. I'll tell you what I mean by this top 30. But what I mean is we got to start focusing on Pete, the decision makers and a little closer to the top of the, the top part of the pyramid. What do I mean? So this is the funding model I always start with, you know, it ebbs and flows for people, but you could kind of sketch it out today. Um, now, if we have money on the right and we have time, I'm going to say time, energy and budget on the left, um, I want, here's where I start, here's where I set my compass for you. I want your top 10 donors yielding between 25 and 40% of your revenue. And then I want your top 30 donors yielding between 50 and 75% all in, right? And this, this leaves, you know, obviously you can do the math at 25% at the bottom, um, which is probably still even a little bit generous. Here's what I want to say to you. Be careful that then if it's like, okay, we need to really crank up our individual giving program. Let's, let's make it this our year. 
you have to be careful that if we're going to try to find larger gifts and try to make sure, um, you know, we, we are securing all the money that's in the relationships that we have, be careful not to spend all of that time on activities that actually only secure restricted gifts. Because sometimes we're like, oh, to get a hundred thousand dollar gift, it'd have to be that one foundation. I don't think we have any individuals who would give that. And then we start doing the things that only are attracting the restricted foundation gifts or the restricted sponsorship gifts. And then we leave money on the table. You know, on the other side, um, we have to make sure on our time and energy and budget that we're not only um, putting most of our time into the things that attract small gifts. Like we need to raise money. We should have another Facebook fundraiser. We should have another 5K. We should have another uh, event, right? Maybe, maybe not though. I want the, if you're going to grow, if you're going to really get on the trajectory of growth and in my example, go from five to 10, you have to make sure that the, the majority of these top gifts are really, really um, rooted in those deep relationships where they understand what you need and they want to give you unrestricted gifts. These are deep, deep partnerships with individuals, with businesses, with family foundations. I call this single source decision makers where there's less of an application, less of a transaction, less of a, we'll, we'll let you know how the vote goes kind of thing. And the opportunity exists for us to sit and talk to the decision maker. This is a huge area where money is left on the table you know, this is the highly relational moment here. Now, what I want to say here is, again, not bashing any of this. These are all amazing. Do them. You got to do them, right? Don't spend all your time there. If we go back to my client, Jonathan, let's bring him back into this. You know, um, here's what it looked like when his staff knew how to set their boundaries, right? Knew how to start aligning their time with the activities that yielded more money. So how did he do it? Let's talk practical here. Um, let's talk about individuals. Well, um, they weren't soliciting a ton, right? There were galas and events and golf outings. And um, so people were coming and they were giving. Uh, and occasionally there'd be like a great lunch. And it's like, I think they'll give. That was a really great lunch. And, and people would. There were, there was, there were generous people. Um, but they, they were not giving their best gift. And so to move into numbers like this, he prioritized the time it takes to really guide a larger donor into those meetings where you're, you are finally sitting down and, and leading them through a conversation that really helps them understand what their gift could do. Um, they weren't soliciting and having having one-on-one -on -one solicitations. Um, you have to learn how to do that. A lot of times we think we are, I'll say, are you, how are you soliciting donors? Well, they get our appeal every year. We have an event. That's not a solicitation for the top part of the pyramid. I don't really want them giving at events. I want them, I want them receiving a one-on-one -on -one ask, if you will. It's not scary, but it's going to take time, right? You, you saw his 2019 to, to 2021. It wasn't like, and within three months, it's this. This takes time to, to move into that. Now, from a business standpoint, okay, pick up, pick up your pencil if you put it down. Because this is where I have seen so much money, especially coming off of 2020, even though we're now officially in quarter three. <laughs> so I'll say we're, we're coming out of 2020. Businesses. Now, guess what? These very transactional sponsorships for our events and for other things, they're great for some corporations and businesses. When it's a win-win, oh my gosh, our logo is going to be the, on the back of $10,000 10, t-shirts at that one event and all of our clients are there and it's amazing. That's a win. That's a win-win sponsorship. Can I tell you how many companies will just give you mission-based gifts because your mission's great and they like you and you've taken the time to build a relationship with them and you actually have found the businesses who are mission aligned and they didn't really want to be sponsoring your, your gala anyhow. They didn't get anything from it. But like, I guess we have to do it. So even an example in Jonathan's case, I had a $50,000 um, event sponsor that was steady, right? We took the time, you know, for the last year, 18 months 
to lead that donor, have those investment level conversations, guide that donor, um, has doubled the gift and is an unrestricted gift. We will never ask that donor again to sponsor something and go back into transaction zone. There's so much money left on the table when we assume they're a business sponsorship. I have business to say to me, what's the deal with these sponsorships? If they just came and talked to me, I'd actually probably give them a bigger gift. Sponsorships are never that donor's best gift. This is what I'm talking about, breaking out of some of the things we've always been taught to do. It's good for some businesses, totally great. Not for all. Listen, listen when it's not a win-win for that, for that business. Okay, other thing I'll say is um, family foundation. So the, these are all those single source decision makers. Now, there's usually a couple people that are making the decision in a family, um, but it's usually not the vote of, you know, 30 people. So um, again, you know, relied on the application, that sort of thing that we all have to do. That's great, right? However, here's what I want to say. A lot of times when I dig a little bit on that relationship with that family foundation, or sometimes it's like it's a relationship with the individual and they just happen to cut their check through the family foundation. A lot of times I'll say like, how did we thank them? How did we report to them? Like, tell me about the relationship. Um, oh, they don't, they don't require a reporter. They don't, they don't want to be thanked. Right. Or they don't, they don't need that. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They need donor experiences. I'm a little frank here on this slide, aren't I? We got to treat them like humans. They're not banks. They're not like, it's October again. You know, I know you gave us 10 last year. Could we do, like, could we do 15? Like, would you be open to that? We have to serve them in greater ways. When my clients start serving foundations more closely, kind of looking like individuals, uh, their gifts skyrocket because everybody else treats them like a bank. It's flat out. There's so much money left on the table here because we're just like in application zone, which leads us to number three. We're doing okay on timing. Um, we have to create these donor experiences every year. We have to create the activities that actually serve that donor and lead them to their best gift. If we're going to truly, you know, it sounds a little buzzy, best gift every year, but if we're truly going to lead that donor to a yes, right? Like we have to deeply um, serve that donor. And don't hear me say, um, oh, we do whatever that donor wants. Don't hear any of that. Don't, this is mission aligned. This is a win-win. This is a mission aligned, wonderful relationship. That's not this or this, right? This is a partnership. I want to be clear on that. But if our goal is to lead donors to give their best gift every year, um, we have to make sure that we as fundraisers are not standing in the way of that. And so when we think of um, what does it look like with us getting in the way, right? And maybe keeping, keep leaving money on the table, um, we have to make sure that we are not making the decisions for our donors before we even get in the room. What do I mean by that? Um, Oftentimes I hear, oh, they can't get, they, they would never give a gift that big. Or from the board side, I don't know any donors who give that. Really? Why are you making that decision? Like, do you have, uh, you know, bank logins to know everybody's accounts or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I want to, so when we think of this sales relationship, right, the best results um, are going to come out of deep relationships that are, that are um, wonderfully, uh, you know, like integrated and it truly is a win-win for everybody. And when it is more of a, a peer relationship because uh, we treat them you know, like humans, like my last slide I said, there's, it's a mission win-win, right? Like it's, we are really stakeholders in our work together. And we can only get to that point when there is a natural, natural comfort level. And, and we've taken that time to get to know our donors and get to know, um, you know, why they would give. And, and, and they've also taken the time to understand what our plans are. And like, this is why we need to move to 10 million. And, and really us being the educator and saying, uh, you know, this is what our stakeholders say. This is what it looks like. This is the right way because we are the experts at our mission, right? That only happens when we've taken the time to build the relationship. It really does. And so what I want you to hear me say today is, 
leading donors to that ask and, 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 and being in relationship to that point where they are understanding and giving their best gift, you actually have way more control. What I mean by that is uh, not pushy control, but leading the donor, guiding their next step, knowing what the next step is. So that when you do get to the point where you're sitting down and having the money conversation, you're like really cool with it. You're really comfortable with it because you got the tools in hand, you got, you know, how to ask, you know what this is. And you've done everything up to now to, you're like, this is actually kind of the easy part because like we've checked all the boxes, if you will. And uh, I'm really confident to be able to sit down and share with them what their investment would look like. Now, the tricky part of kind of moving into these activities, you know, aside from we've, we've talked about the time, right? Um, to make sure that we're, we're, we're moving into all of these strategic activities. I guess it's a little obvious, but I'll do a quick recap as we wrap up and, and I answer your questions. Um, you have to know what to stop doing, right? What is, what are you, how, it might be, sometimes it's budgeting. Sometimes it's um, not raising to the right number. Sometimes it's how you talk about what you do. I've got a really technical client, really amazing. Uh, you'd know that it's a, it's a medical, you know, they're, they're solving a, a, a curing an awful disease. Um, sometimes it's how we talk about what we do that's keeping donors from understanding our need. Oh, I thought you guys like had, like were just funded by the, all these research grants, or I thought you guys got all that funding from the state, or I saw on LinkedIn that one person came and wrote you that $8 million check. I, I didn't think you needed it, right? Are we doing the things that are keeping donors from giving their best gift or attracting them, right? Then um, you have to make sure every year in your annual planning, your annual strategy, your annual budget, that all has to be set up to attract donors who actually understand the whole need, understand you're right. It's not just programs we got to invest in. You need programs, admin, fundraising, and an overhead, excuse me, and a reserve because that makes you a great organization, a strong organization, a sustainable organization. And I wanna to give to that. I wanna to give to the whole need. I wanna give an unrestricted gift to that need, right? Um, and then I guess, you know, we, I do a lot of coaching of how, like, what do we do once we get, once we start having those relationships? How do we ask? What do we need to have in hand? Um, you know, how do we, um, how do we start doing all the things that are required for these high ROI relationships, right? Um, sometimes it feels like bravery, but I'll tell you if you have the tools in hand and uh, it's, it's really not that scary. Um, and maybe most important, and we talked about stop doing things, you have to be open to starting to do different activities that actually move you closer. It might not be exact, but pointing our compass closer to that 50 to 75% of revenue. So, so frankly, we can get off the spin cycle that I hear so many people on. Um, the spin cycle is kind of keeping us from doing the things that, that fully fund our organizations and fully fund those things that are in your strategic plan that we want you to do, right? And you want to do, and, and our communities need you to do. Um, I, I've said in every, as I've wrapped up every, maybe every webinar in the last 18 months, I truly believe like there has never been a time when nonprofits have deserved more. Like you have shown up like nobody's business, right? I, I don't need to tell you um, it locally, you know, statewide, nationally, I mean, internationally. Um, it's the most humbling time for those of us who are serving the sector. Uh, Stephen probably agree um, to serve you in, in, and hopefully to serve you well while you're uh, really solving and, and fighting all of these crises um, that we've had in our world. Um, but you might need to embrace, you know, kind of new model, new mindset, new skills um, to really level you up to that next level. So as we look to the Q&A, um, I'll shoot you a link, but um, I teach this methodology all over the country to um, to groups who are smaller and under that $2 million mark to executive directors, development directors, boards. Um, I also teach it to, to bigger teams who really are, they're wanting to scale by millions um, and, and know their mission is worthy of that, but don't totally know the path to that. Um, and I also teach to larger organizations who, um, who maybe have a national presence, but really want to boost some of their, some of their regions. So um, to reach out to me if, if, if and ever you're, you're ready. And if not, we'll see what questions people have. From that fire hose I just gave. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Jerry. That was awesome. Um, Thanks, wow, Steven. we got a lot of questions here. We may not be able okay. to get to all of them in the next five minutes, but um, thank I'll, you. I can reply to them too if I if you give yeah, them to I'll me. Yeah, I'll send I'm them to you. To. Mm -hmm. And when you said segmentation, I was so, oh, ooh, this this, web, <laughs> this webinar is for me. So th there's some good ones in here. You know, my buddy Andrew here uh, one stood out to me, and you know, there's a lot of small shops listening, as yeah. I, you know, you're used to, I know. But if you're a one yeah. person shop. You know, the board, part-time volunteers, what do you think? What's, yeah. what's the role there? Yeah, sorry I use such a giant, I, I just like to use big round numbers so I don't have to do math with anybody. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, like I, the same methodology works if you're raising $300,000. The, 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 the compass and the, the pyramid is still the same. And even Andrew, I'll, um, when I send back the email, I'll put a case study in there of a client of mine in Houston um, who was fully volunteer, uh, fully a volunteer run, right? And now they, uh, I don't think they're five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. They're fully funded at month six of the year. Um, these same principles work. Now, if you're part time, it's like even more reason for you to be focusing on that pyramid because now we got half the time to really focus on those activities, right? Um, so uh, it. It, my point is it works. It might take a little longer. You got to be super strategic. And I would also say to you, because my guess is you kind of have a working board then alongside you, hopefully you do. They got to understand this too. They can't be in the rational frugality over here when you're trying to grow it over here. Um, so really work on getting them to understand a, you know, a model like this so that every hour, if they're going to spend one or two hours a month on fundraising to help you, it can't be down on Facebook fundraisers. It's got to be up on strategic, strategic level gifts. That okay. makes a lot of sense. Um, here's one from Angie. What role would you assign to the board development committee? Uh, their development committee is afraid to ask for money and primary wants to report to the development director. That's any, any experience with having a development committee on the board? Oh, I've never board? heard a board member that's afraid to ask for money. That doesn't. <laughs> we've never done webinars I've on that. I've never should... heard that. <laughs> Um, let me tell you an answer, uh, Angie, that I feel like is a little bit different. So my approach to the board when they're like, oh, we don't know anybody, we don't want to do it, and we don't like to do it. We have to demystify what fundraising is for them. Because usually when they say, I hate it, I don't want to do it, it's because they think it's something different than it really is. Uh, I think today I described something as, let's be, let's have relationships with people, let's talk to them. Let's be human. Um, so my point is, my advice is always, sometimes, no, all the time, I should say, I want you to actually create a great donor experience for your board members. Each one of them, it's different for, why are they involved? Each one is different. I want you to serve them. I want you, even if you have a give get, I don't care. I want you to solicit them every year. Then I want you to thank them in a way that knocks their socks off. And, and then I want you to lead them back through that journey every year. You have to model it to your board members before they understand what to do. Because they're experts at something else. They're lawyers, they're, doc they're doctors, they're, I don't know, accountants. They don't know what to do. So instead of like, give me more names or like, we gotta teach them how to fundraising. My best, of bit, best and biggest advice would be model it for them. Show them how it's done. Because then they're gonna be like, you're, pretty, you're kind of good at this, Angie. Like that actually felt good. Like, you know what? I was thinking I should introduce you to my colleague who's really interested in X, Y, Z. Yeah, show them how it's done. Yeah, it's not just going to happen automatically, right? You got to guide them. It's like yeah. anything else. It makes sense. Well, dang, it's, it's already three Eastern. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Yes. Uh, and I'll send you the questions that, that we didn't get to. I'll answer um, them. How can people reach out to you? What's a, what's a good way to get in touch? Yeah, with? hop on my website. It's right there. Uh, Quam Taylor. That's my maiden and my married name mushed together. Um, I'm also, as Stephen knows, on LinkedIn uh, a lot. So <laughs> shoot me a message over there or follow me over there. I put all my uh, first round content on LinkedIn um, and hop on my website and contact me. There's some good stuff on there. You've got some cool freebies and stuff. And Thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, dang, this was a lot of fun. It's good to, to see you. I hope we can be in person again soon, Sherry. I but, hope uh, so. This is, you know, webinar is always a, a decent uh, a way to do it. So thanks for doing this. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Appreciate it. And everybody have a good rest of your summer. Yeah, please do. And and join us next week. Uh, we got a, we got another webinar next week. We're doing a special Wednesday session. So I know we said I'm do it. We do every Thursday, but we got we got a webinar on Wednesday on grants. Uh, our buddy Rachel Warner. 
Oh, I misspelled poor Rachel's name. Let me just fix that since I'm not presenting. <laughs> Rachel. That's embarrassing. She's awesome. One of our go-to for grants. And um, yeah, totally free, totally educational. Uh, if grants is a, a pain point for you, join us. Cause she's gonna, she's been really looking at like what has been going on since COVID. Um, so good. And, you know, obviously foundations have made a lot of changes and things. So she's on top of that. And it'll be fun. And we're gonna record it just like this one. So uh, if you can't make it, register anyway, and then you'll just get the recording. Like all of you are about to give me a couple hours and you'll have this session, the recording, the slides and, um, and some goodies from, from Sherry too. So we'll call it a day there. Um, have a good rest of your Thursday, have a good weekend, stay safe, stay healthy. And, uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again next Wednesday. See ya. Thanks guys. <laughs>